Well, good morning, everyone. It's my absolute honor to kick off the Educator Summit. For those who don't know, I'm Mindy Farmer. I'm the director of the Mayport Visitor Center. And I just want you to know that we are here for you. There are few communities we value more than teachers. We are so excited to have each and every one of you here. And I can promise you, having worked at Kent State for a number of years now, you're getting our A game. From Todd to Annette to Chick to Laura to everyone who's coming here, these are some of the best people on campus. And I can't wait for you to get this experience. If you ever need anything from us today, please make sure you talk to anyone here. And beyond this, if you want tours for your classrooms or materials or speakers, please know we are here for you. The kids who are here on May 4, 1970, were not far from being high school students. And we don't forget that message. So please let us know if we can help. And welcome to the May 4 Visitor Center. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, I want to welcome you. Good morning. It's nice to see everybody here. It looks like everybody's gotten settled, even the people in the back row. You have your books. You have all your materials. If you have any questions, always ask. We're here for you. We want to make sure that you have a great experience, and we know that you will. We're excited over the next two days to learn with you and to think about connecting the legacy of May 4 to students and communities today, to issues that your students talk about, think about, engage with, in their lives and we are confident that you will take a tremendous amount from this experience and we want to let you know that we are here to make sure that happens and to support you i'm going to talk plenty over the next two days so i'm just going to go right into introducing chick camphora and we are honored that she is here before i introduce chick i want to also make sure to thank Dr. Tom Grace for his talk last night. Uh, everyone. <laughs> and Tom, thank you for being here today. Dr. Roseanne Chick Camphora was an eyewitness and survivor of the Kent State shootings and a sister of wounded student Alan Camphora. A Kent 25 defendant, Chick was one of 24 students indicted by the Ohio Grand Jury for activism during a weekend of protests against the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Since 1970, Chick Camphora has been a stalwart advocate for May 4 Remembrance, standing up to university administrations that tried to distance KSU from its place in history, including an effort in 1975 to end May 4 commemoration events and protests against construction of a gymnasium on the shooting site in 1977. Chick, a high school journalism teacher for 28 years, I'd like to return to that part, a teacher for 28 years, currently teaches journalism at Kent State University and was a crisis communications consultant for the Broward County School District following the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018. Chick is founding president of the Kent May 4 Center, a current member of the 50th Anniversary Commemoration Planning Committee, and a frequent speaker at May 4 events. We are honored to have her speak with you today. Please help me in welcoming Chick Camphora. Well, I'm armed with technology, thanks to a former student, Pat Fenner, who's back there. He was one of my journalism students at Hudson High School when I was teaching TV broadcasting. And he is the techie that I continue to go to when I say, I don't have a clicker, what should I do? So I have his phone, which is gonna be a clicker, which is why I'm gonna be kind of like this. Uh, so thank you, Pat, for that. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for everything that you do every single day um, in your classrooms, which to me, as a teacher for 28 years, I know how challenging that can be, and I also know how influential you are in the lives of kids. I know from the students that still get on my Facebook page and ask if I remember them, or will write me a letter 
saying, do you remember that diaphragmatic breathing exercise we did in speech class when you told us to envision ourselves 10 years from now? And I'm like, kind of. <laughs> what day was that? And he's like, what I was envisioning is exactly what I'm doing now. I'm an attorney, and I live in Washington, D.C., and it was like, oh, my God. I couldn't even remember much, except I think I remember where he sat. Students will come up to me and say, hey, do you remember me? And it's like, I don't remember their face. I don't remember their name exactly to connect with it. But I kind of remember how they behaved. And it's like, wait a minute, didn't you? Uh, and it's like, they have an indelible mark on our lives in the same way that we have an indelible mark on their lives. And so for that, I just want to thank you um, and know that I appreciate everything you do. When I was asked to speak to an educator summit, my first thought was, oh my God, there's so much I want to say to educators. And I tossed in my mind, do I, how many of them will be English teachers like I was, who many years I had the high school yearbook thrown in my lap and the school newspaper thrown in my lap, but I had never taken journalism courses. And it was my teaching education that made me go back to school and get my master's degree in journalism so that I could really teach my students what journalistic writing is all about, that it's um, not narrative writing and expository writing that I was teaching in my English classes, but it was much more brief. But it was through that decision in my educational career that led me to, at the top of every single test and assignment that I gave to my journalism students, and Pat might remember this, I said, put the definition of journalism. And the definition I always taught was the one that I was taught in Journalism 101 in college. Journalism is accurate, objective, untainted information that the people can use in their decision making, especially their political decision making. And that has always stayed with me, even today as a teacher in the School of Journalism here, where in our media power and culture class, we work very hard with beginning college students on media literacy so that they truly do know the difference between fake news and real news. And we have a president right now that is branding a free press as fake news, and that's a very dangerous trend in our democracy. Now, I'm going to apologize ahead of time that I'm going to be a little political, and I make no apology for the fact that I'm a Democrat, and there's probably Republicans in this room, and I appreciate you. I have voted Republican before, and that will surprise some of my friends. I have a good friend, Ann Wilmer Benjamin, who's the mayor of Aurora, and when she ran for uh, state rep, I not only campaigned for her, but I voted for her because she was somebody who really was a strong proponent of public education. And I drove to Columbus and had lunch with her and said, why is it that you're supporting charter schools? Why is it that you are supporting at least the rise of charter schools that aren't held to the same accountable, accountability standards that public schools are? And basically she said to me, you have no idea the pressure I'm under. And I said, what, from the party? Yeah, if she didn't toe the party line, she would not be reelected. So I say that just because a lot of my experience as an educator, but also as a learner, has helped to mold me into what I am today, and that is a radical. America produces radical behavior in the far right, the far left, and also in between. And so I thought the best thing I could do, particularly knowing that you're going to be touring the May 4th site today, was maybe just share with you my college, uh, I would call it, photo album. And that's what I did. I just went through and pulled a bunch of pictures that I thought might stick in your mind when you take the tour of the May 4th site today so that you can actually picture the people that my brother will be describing um, not just the guardsmen, but the students. And I was one of them that moved from the commons area over to Blanket Hill, where the National Guard, almost 50 years ago, opened fire on us. Before I start this, the uh, photo album slideshow and kind of narrate uh, from a personal perspective what we did, I want to tell you a little bit about what brought me to Kent State. My brother, Alan, and I, and you're going to meet him on the slideshow, um, were two of the original Sputnik kids in America. Uh, back in the 50s, during the Cold War, America got real worried that Russia was going to beat us in the space race. 
And so they decided to fund all kinds of uh, uh, gifted education initiatives. And um, I'll never forget following, in fact, my doctoral dissertation is devoted to the experience of being pulled from my third grade class and taken to a little room where I actually thought when I was following this brown briefcase down the hall that this guy was going to do something terrible to me. And when we were in this little room off of the social room in Central School in Barberton, when he opened up this briefcase, I was scared of what he was going to take out and what he was going to do to me. And it was the Stanford Binet IQ test. And I remember how I felt when, I, when he opened it up and I saw what looked like, you know, tiny little toys in it. And he started asking me questions, and there's a real irony in it, because I'll never forget that one of the photos he showed me was a guy with a Daniel Boone hat, and he was holding a rifle. And he said, what's wrong with this picture? And my answer was, he's shooting at the people furthest away. So later, we'll reflect on why that still haunts me today. But I was chosen for the first Barberton major work group, and so was my brother Alan. I was in third grade, he was in fourth. We had to go way across town in Barberton and go to that class, and it was one of the most magical years of my life. In the classroom of Alice Lautzenheiser, everything was exactly what we're learning today about inquiry-based learning, what we're learning today about really helping kids to learn problem-solving skills, to get them out of their seats, to do group learning and things like that. It was so different from everything that I'd experienced up to the fourth grade. We were always singing. We were always dancing. Even if we were lining up for recess, we were, you know, first you divide, then you multiply. When I was working on my doctoral dissertation and trying to find the 15 members of my original cohort in that gifted education class, I could not believe how many people, it, we were like near 50 then, because this was what, 2001. We were already 50. How many of my classmates that I found all over the country actually broke into song? I mean, like they were, like Greg Lance, who's an attorney out in Arizona, goes, wait, wait, hold on. And like literally, I'm, I'm sitting there on the phone, paying long distance back then. You d probably don't even remember what that is. Um, but he came back, he goes, I still have the mural. You know, and it was like when I interviewed each one of these people, 50 years later, they couldn't recall teachers' names, they couldn't recall assignments, but they could recall everything we learned in that fourth grade year with Alice Lautzenheiser. And that was a big part of my dissertation research was what was it that made gifted education in that first year so real and so challenging and really so rigorous and also all the things we want enriching and why wasn't it that way the next year? And why wasn't it that way the next year? If I were to turn my doctoral dissertation into a book, it would be called In Search of Mrs. Lautzenheiser, because I was in search of her for the rest of my days. Of the 15 members of our cohort, one of them never responded to me. His name was Raleigh, and I know it was because we were mean to him. We were terrible to him. I feel so bad about it, and, and I deserved that he ignored me when I reached out to him. Um, one of our members had committed suicide. Some of us went on to do amazing things, um, and some of us went on to college, and a lot of us didn't. A lot of us were disenchanted with education as a result of a failed educational innovation that was supposed to be taking the best and the brightest of America and, and sending us up to change the world. Well. I'm, this isn't a, a um, commentary so much on gifted education, but it is on politics. Because the one thing I found was how so many things in education um, influenced those educational innovations. Uh, I interviewed our teachers who just thought, some of them actually said, we hated you kids. You know, you were just brats. You were so precocious. And, you know, every time I would teach you something, you'd say, prove it. You know, um, and, and, and you know, it was so interesting to talk to my teachers in retrospect and go, no wonder you were always so mean to us. No wonder, and then he would say, I would give you 150 problems and you'd do 50 of them and say, I'm done. I'm not, you know, this doesn't even make sense. 
because we knew our counterparts in the, uh, the, gifted, the non-gifted classes were doing 50 problems, we were doing 150, and that's what they thought enrichment was in those days. Except for Mrs. Loudsenheiser. And I wanted to say that because I'd say she did more than anything in my lifetime to make me fall in love with education. So I wanted to be a teacher like her. And I always was the one that said, I don't care if you're perched on my file cabinet to those ADD kids. You know, they always sent the worst kids in my classroom. Because I remember that a lot of us kids who were gifted back then were seen as learning disabled. We were seen as just problem kids. You know, we would always be the ones who would have to go water the plants or, you know, clean the erasers because what do we do with all that energy? And knowing that Mrs. Lautzenheiser changed our lives, I made it a commitment in my work as a journalism teacher to always look at my content in a way that a guy who wrote the book Teaching as a Subversive Activity back in 1969 and influenced me so much in the College of Education here, he said, you know, always think about what is worth knowing, period. What is worth knowing? And so in another talk, I'd love to tell you how during the Puritan era of American literature, I loved teaching sinners in the hands of an angry God so that people really could see what religious extremism can do to just reason and intellect. You know, I love teaching the transcendental period so that that man is basically bad, he's born with original sin, was finally replaced with maybe man is basically good and it's society that corrupts us. And how do we fix those things in society that corrupt us? I love teaching journalism, I love teaching American Lit, because I could be so political all the time. I could just bring my point of view in the classroom all the time, and I didn't think it was wrong to do so, but I'll tell you something, I'd be more guarded today. Because I work in Cleveland schools, and I've seen my share of people videotaped and whatever, I'd probably be fired today for being too political, I'd be on social media all over the place. Look at this radical teacher who should be fired. So I'm really, really happy that I was teaching at a time when I felt free, really, to influence students, not indoctrinate them, but influence them to think and to be very, very thoughtful as a teacher to what is worth knowing. And the most important thing that drove me as a teacher, it is worth knowing how lucky we are to live in a democracy. How fortunate we are that in America, we have a free press. We have a voice. I can stand up in a classroom and say, you know what? <laughs> I'm a student of the 60s. I could talk about my Kent State experience to my students and why I teach the way I do and why I respect that they'll go to a history class with that very Republican, uh, good friend of mine, um, teacher that said the opposite of me. And they all joined my debate team and I would have the kids who would argue one side flip and argue the other side because that is what I cherish about living in a democracy. We can disagree. We were the grand experiment we were the one nation that could open our doors to every color, creed, ethnic background, and we could live together in the same neighborhood and not kill each other. You know, I look at the Middle East and I look at what, you know, I learned here at Kent State it was Mesopotamia. They've been warring for 7,000 years. And so you're going to hear me talk once I go through the, the slideshow of how much my whole career here as a college student I kept wondering, what are we fighting for? And, and that has taken on double meaning for me. Why are we fighting each other? But also, what really, in our lifetime, are we fighting for, if not for change and to preserve this democracy? And so I'm going to encourage you strongly to be the kind of teacher that Mrs. Lautzenheiser was for us, get those kids up and out of their seats, Think very carefully when you look at the curriculum about whether it or not it is something worth their knowing. I, I saw a student panel in Baltimore recently as part of my current job, and I remember one student saying, you know, those the, the, our, our, you know, adults in our world that were in the 60s, they had all these causes to fight for. What do we have to fight for? You know, they, th they had a war, they said. They didn't have the right to vote. And I can't even tell you how many issues came into my mind. They are so strapped with tuition debt. 
that's not enough? Minimum wage? Are you kidding? It's not a livable wage. Climate? They're going to be here a, a, a lot longer than we are. How, why are those issues not coming to mind? That is our responsibility as educators, to make sure that we always challenge them to think about what's worth knowing. Because they are the, the next generation that will take care of us. So let's talk a little bit about Kent State. When I came here, I wasn't a radical. I was uh, a cheerleader in Barberton High School. I was um, actually so narrow-minded that when I came here, I was a supporter of the war because I grew up admiring my parents who were World War II veterans and going through my mother's army scrapbooks and dreaming of being an army whack like her. Then there were people that influenced me a lot. My brother, Alan, one year older than me, I always admired him, one year older than I. Um, I always admired my brother, and he became much more political much faster than I did here. Um, this guy also influenced me, Frankie. He, I went to school with him from the time I went to my first major work group in fourth grade, and he went off to Vietnam when we went off to college. This is our group, and you can see Dr. Tom Grace right here. Um, this is Jimmy Riggs. These are the crazies. We called ourselves the crazies. Uh, James Michener in his book called us the Che Guevara gang. But this was our group, and Jimmy Riggs at the far right is actually the, the roommate of my brother's that pulled me behind a parked car and saved my life on May 4th. Yep. Yes, and in fact, the tallest one over there uh, lived with um, Alan and Tom and Jimmy um, on, in Dubet's apartments here in Kent. And um, his younger brother, Bill, uh, was serving in Vietnam at the time that this picture was taken. And Bill was killed 10 days before May 4th, which was a catalyst for our protest here. These four people are in my college photo album because they are among the people I most remember from my college experience. This was our campus, and I lived in Lake Hall, which is just over Blanket Hill. I just happened, I was a phys ed major when I got here. I thought I was going to be a gym teacher. Um, and then when I realized I was so small and couldn't compete with the phys ed majors in my field hockey class, I switched to speech and hearing therapy. Um, but this is a, a photo I want you to remember of the ROTC building on the College Commons here. Pat, wait, is this advancing but not on me, on mine? Yeah, okay, I think the screen is frozen up here, so anyway, that, co that army barracks um, ended up the weekend of May 1st through 4th. You're going to take a tour of the May 4th site, but I want to give you perspective on what happened on, on Monday. Friday night, uh, there was an action in downtown Kent after Nixon decided to escalate the Vietnam War rather than to wind it down, which is what he promised when he ran for re-election. Uh, college campuses across the country were in arms. Uh, there were protests all over. In fact, that day, earlier, we went down to Ohio State to join their protests because there wasn't anything happening on Kent until Monday when there was a planned student strike. On Saturday night, the ROTC building burned, and I want to take your questions about why we were motivated to, to engage in, in radical behaviors. Now, I want um, you to consider this. On downtown Kent on Friday night, a number of students were just painting buildings, uh, U.S. out of Cambodia. Um, there was uh, an action in downtown Kent that resulted in, in the breaking of windows and uh, that was seen as something that would be used for many, many years to justify what happened on Monday at Kent State. On Saturday, when the ROTC building burned down, if you look at the Kent State history books, you will learn that uh, it was burned down under questionable circumstances because students were not actually in a position to burn it down, although students tried to. It was an old army barracks that was scheduled for demolition and didn't have a great deal of value. Many people believe it was torched actually to justify bringing in the Ohio National Guard to quell a disturbance under Governor Rhodes at that time. This is what it looked like when that army barracks on campus um, 
was destroyed. On Monday, keep in mind, there were militant students on Friday night and Saturday night very, very angry about the invasion of Cambodia. On Sunday night, though, as students started to come back, some of the more um, uh, liberal-minded elements, less radical, some of the students who weren't political at all, convened on front campus and wanted to talk to President White so that President White would come out and talk with us about the fact that the Ohio National Guard had moved on to our campus and um, he, we w had hoped he would come out and talk with us. We didn't know that President White wasn't even on campus at the time. We were tricked by the Ohio National Guard to go back onto the campus and out of the street uh, so that uh, President White would come and talk with us. Uh, we did that and then that was the night that the tear gas flew for the first time and several students were bayoneted. Now, Monday, May 4th, is, which is what you're gonna focus on today in the tour, there were a lot of students now, and in this crowd are people that were not politically active at all. This was our campus, this was our home, and now it was invaded by the Ohio National Guard. And our Kent State University administration was pretty much absent, and we were unaware. That is Jeff Miller, who later is killed. That's Bill Schroeder. It's my brother, Alan, running with a black flag. That's Allison, later killed. Sandy, who I met when I was a speech and hearing therapy major in the music and speech building. Sandy's brother, or Sandy's sister was married to my roommate, Lois's brother. So Sandy was in our dorm room quite often because Lois and Sandy rode home together. The plan was to strike, and that would appeal to a lot more students than the militant actions in downtown Kent on Friday night. I'm not condoning violence, and I never do when I talk to students about what happened in 1970 here. But I understand what made people, like my brother and I, so fresh on the heels of Bill Caldwell's funeral, behave in militant ways, behave in ways we never would have before. You know, to, I can't tell you why it felt so good to throw a rock through the Army recruitment office window. But I know why I did it. And I know that I was willing to go to jail for malicious destruction of property. It felt good to write U.S. out of Cambodia on a building downtown, thinking whoever sandblasts this off will have to think about what we're doing to human beings, not to buildings in Vietnam. I understand what makes people do things they otherwise would never do and behave in radical ways. When the National Guard Jeep drove up, it was a crowd of people who thought like me and were as ready as I was to engage in militant actions, but also a lot of people coming to protest not only the invasion of the Ohio National Guard, but to also express their points of view about the actions in downtown Kent on Friday and on campus on Saturday. There were people inspired or angered by the sit-in that we had on front campus who came there upset because President White never came out to talk to us, that the National Guard were standing at every one of our dorms. It was offensive. There were people there for various reasons, but the primary reason was we were going to join a national student strike, probably the most, and in retrospect, absolutely, the most powerful thing we could do as students is stand together, say we're not going to class until you bring our friends home. We didn't have the right to vote for the people sending them there, but we had this voice. We had this national voice, and we didn't even have snail mail. I mean, we had snail mail. We didn't even have social media at the time to connect with each other. How we did that, I don't know, but we did that. When the National Guard Jeep drove up and read the Riot Act, it was humorous. It was like, what do you, there's no riot. They advanced on us with tear gas. We ran up over the hill. My brother found this photo of me with wet rags in my hand. There were people at the top of the hill passing out wet rags for the tear gas. And the Ohio National Guard that indicted me for Monday, May 4th, actually had a caption under it that said, Chick Camphora carrying rocks, uh, to perpetrating the old myth that we were throwing rocks. But that's tear gas. Um, that's wet rags in, in my hands. 
You can see Alison Krauss with her leg out there. It's one of the last photographs of her. As she did, like the rest of us, ran over the top of Blanket Hill to the other side. And the guard had really succeeded in doing what they were told to do, disrupt our rally. This is people milling around afterwards in the Prentice Hall parking lot here. Adjacent to that lot was one um, gravel parking lot aligning Dunbar Hall. And when you go through the tour, look at it. I, it's, it's been changed a little bit. I believe it's paved now. But back then, it was the one place where students picked up stones and started throwing them in the direction of the guard in a practice football field. Now, the guard were on about the 50-yard line. It proved to be more of a danger to us than the guards because the stones fell short. The guardsmen had on steel helmets and gas masks, and they were throwing the stones back. So the stone throwing incident stopped. And I want to I want to stress that because it has been used for 50 years to justify something that happened much much later when nothing was being thrown at the guard. This is a pivotal moment here that was captured in history, and you see it on books, including Tom Grace's book, and Laura's too, I believe. Um, it's my brother Alan at the moment when. He left us in the Prentice parking lot and started to walk toward the National Guard who were at the 50-yard line about on the practice football field at the bottom. You won't see that practice football field because it's been covered by the uh, Kent State University Gymnasium Annex. It was here that I walked up to my brother and said, Alan, they're aiming right at you. It bothered me that they were kneeling and actually lifting their weapons. It never occurred to me that they would shoot, but it bothered me that they were looking through the scopes of their rifles at my brother. And I said, please come back to the parking lot with me. They're in. I said, this is getting really shaky. And he said right here, wait, I want to see where they're going. And where they went was up the hill. And it looked like they were leaving. They had stopped the tear gas, and we started chanting, they're going, they're leaving, we won. It was kind of a, an air of triumph before we saw them turn. Other guardsmen continued over the hill, but only Troop G, when they reached the pagoda, the, the, probably the most strategically wise point if you had planned to shoot because it would be the, you know, the best way to view whatever your targets are, and I want you to take out a watch and time 13 seconds at some point. 13 seconds, they continued to shoot while people ran and dove. And in fact, I was in the parking lot and was fortunate to get behind a parked car that was sh shattered. The, the windows of the car were shattering over us as we crouched behind it. People were trying to get behind the tires. It just, everybody was scared. The bullets were come underneath the car. We could hear them thumping on the ground. And you'll hit, see that in a clip that we're going to show. And the aftermath. It was at that point when I came out from behind the parked car that shielded me that I saw Bill Schroeder lying three feet behind me, and he, he was dead. It was moments later that I saw a girl being taken to the yard at Prentice Hall. I didn't know it was Sandy Scheuer um, because she was so blue and gray, having been shot through the jugular vein. It was at that moment you could see Jimmy holding me when I saw a boy lying at the foot of the hill and remembered that that would have been where I'd last seen Alan. When I got to the body of Jeff Miller, I, I felt ashamed for a long time that I felt relief when I saw his, his clothing that it wasn't my brother. And, um, but it was at that moment when I looked at the body of Jeff Miller that uh, another of Alan's roommates, Jeff Hartzler, came up behind me and said, Alan and Tom both got hit. Mary Vecchio's Pulitzer Prize winning um, image in this photograph taken by John Philo captured the horror that we all felt. It was a gruesome scene, but I show it because I want you to understand what made some people, when the ambulances came and everyone was attending to it, Another one of our roommates, Tom Miller, we called him Tom Aquinas. He was such a peaceful, loving person, completely lost it. Picked up the flag that Alan had dropped and 
dipped it in Jeff Miller's blood and was flinging it on people saying, look at this, remember this. He was never the same. He's no longer with us. He died years later in an automobile accident, but he um, became extremely religious after this and left politics. One of the things that haunts me the most is that after 13 young kids, 18, 19-year-old college kids, lay bleeding and dying, the National Guard, who were sent here to protect life and property, just turned around and walked down the other side of the hill, leaving us there. When some guardsmen came back and started to throw some tear gas again, students barricaded some of the victims to keep the guardsmen away from them. Glenn Frank, my geology professor here at Kent State, was the one who made a strong appeal that we should just go back to our dorms because he was afraid there would be a slaughter. I, um, I know that I was in shock because when I was doing my student teaching at um, Wadsworth High School, years later, uh, a guy named Joe Gaines, who was a history teacher there, saw me in the hallway and said, I remember you. You're the girl that came running in my classroom in Bowman Hall on May 4th saying, my, my brother's been killed, the National Guardsman is shot. And I was like, tell me what I did, because I didn't remember that. My brother, who left the practice football field, was able, once the guard turned, to run over to this tree, and that's what protected him, I later learned. That's Tom Miller, Aquinas, standing behind the tree. That's my brother, Alan, crouching after he'd already been hit in the right wrist, and Tom Grace was to his right, already having been shot, with Alan yelling, stay down, stay down. These images have been captured um, in newspaper and magazine accounts over the years. Richard Nixon said, when dissent turns to violence, it invites tragedy, and of course, this on the heels of calling campus protesters bums, on the heels of Richard Agnew likening us to, no, Spiro Agnew likening us to uh, Nazis and Klansmen, Governor Reagan in California saying, if these students want a bloodbath, let's get it over, and Governor Rhodes in Ohio saying that we were worse than the night Riders and vigilantes, the worst type of people we harbor in America. It's over with in Ohio. We're not going to treat the symptoms. We're going to eradicate the problem. And with all of that hateful rhetoric, it gave way to headlines like this. We were bums. But the protest continued. And this is why I believe that Monday was the most significant thing that Kent State students could have done to end the war then. While government forces thought that killing a few students, and we know this from a lot of research, might actually quell disturbance, in fact, it ignited protests on college campuses across the country, saying, we will not forget. And it kept Kent State alive for the last 50 years, despite the fact that the university decided after five years it was long enough to remember. In seven years, they actually changed the name Kent State to Kent to just disassociate itself from its history. Uh, they put a gymnasium on the site of the May 4th uh, shootings, where we had gone for years to teach people about what happened here. We moved onto this hill for 62 days. We lived through several tornadoes. We lived in tents. We actually burned the injunctions that came and told us we had to leave the hill. It was one of the most um, significant struggles. My, br my father was a city councilman in Barberton. He was recalled from office for joining us on the hill, as along with my mother, along with Sandy Scheuer's parents um, and a Methodist minister that always united the families of the victims. He later won his seat back. but. Um, my whole family went to jail together, my three brothers, my parents, and I, to protect the May 4th site. This is one of our attorneys that, that defended us in the Kent 25. I have to believe that all of those actions in those years had a lot to do with, despite the fact that the university fought us on remembering and wanted so much to forget, it was that, those actions, including the tent city occupation, that it made it possible for us to get the May 4th Memorial, so people would never forget the history that happened here. It was students, including the Daily Kent Stater and a free press on this campus, that helped people to remember every year. 
It was people like Alan and Tom and others who came back year after year to take people on tours. And all of us, you, I actually, my, my speeches are pretty much, you know, shows like my changing hairdo. Um, uh, but for years, people would say, why do you come back every year? And I think this is the year that I said, because of my children. These are my three children. I never wanted them to not be safe on a college campus. I could not forget what happened here for fear that it would happen again. And Florence Schroeder, these are the family, family members of the victims that came back year after year. Friends like Jerry Casali, who, who um, inducted uh, Allison into the Honors College here. Um, Barry Levine, who, oh no, it's Sandy. He, uh, it was, oh, Jerry Casali is the, uh, is he the lead singer? Or, he's, he, he, he's one of the founders of the band Devo, which we hope is going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame soon, but that's Casali. And um, Barry Levine, who Alison Krauss died in his arms. Um, Dean Kaler, who was paralyzed that day. Mary Vecchio in the Pulitzer Prize winning photo. It's all of these people that have come back year after year, including this guy you heard last night in such an eloquent speech, that every year said, we will not forget. And I have to say that, and you know, we created the Kent Mayforth Center to do what we had always hoped that the university would do. And that is what we're doing here today, educating about May 4th. But I have to really credit my brother, whose uh, jacket with his bullet hole through it is on display at the Ohio History Center because we didn't have a place like this visitor center to put those um, things that will make us remember. This is Alan with Colonel Fassinger. I always held out hope that the guardsmen would come through and do what we've done for 50 years. Tell the truth they know. We're way past vengeance. We're way past wanting them to go to jail. We just want to know why they shot us. It wasn't because there were rocks, bricks, and bottles being thrown at them. That was disproven long ago. It wasn't because they were afraid of us. We weren't even close to them when this happened. Was it the rhetoric? Was it what Nixon said about us that dehumanized us so? Was it what Agnew said? Governor Reagan? Governor Rhodes? Is that what made them shoot? Before they're all dead, we pray they will come back and do what we've been doing. Just tell us the truth of what happened. I'm willing to admit I don't like what I did in downtown Kent on Friday night. I'm a little bit proud of it, but I still think it was stupid. You know, I, don't, I didn't agree with the burning of the ROTC building, but I do know there is strength in numbers. I do know that Monday we had the greatest impact on government policy. And we would have had the greatest impact on bringing that war home. Um, bringing our friends home from that war um, had we not been shot down, but then it turned out it had the same effect anyway. But anyway, they continue to lie. The Ohio National Guardsmen are either silent or they perpetrate the old myths. So the commemorations continue, the candlelight vigils continue, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we were successful under Carol Cartwright in getting the markers put in the spots uh, where the four students fell. It always bothered Martin Scheuer in particular that when people would stand in at uh, a vigil in Sandy's spot every year, the next day there would be tire treads in the candle wax. And so the, it meant the most to him. And I'll never forget meeting with Carol Cartwright and literally appealing to her and saying, please, Martin Scheuer is in a nursing home. Let us deliver the news that nobody will ever park on Sandy's spot again. So the, the uh, sensitivity of the Kent State University administration began to soften with Carol Cartwright, who came to our commemorations and also led the way for permanent markers where the students fell. And to her, we are grateful. We gave her a plaque on May 4th um, to honor the university's changing role. Um, having the visitor center. A lot of, you know, the activism that I'm showing you over the years has everything to do with the university finally realizing it owns this. This is our tragedy. This is our history. This is our legacy, and it's okay to just learn the right lessons from it. But more was to come, and we had no idea. There's a dean in the visitor center. Of course, I had to throw this in because I got to take this guy on a tour. And I loved stopping right here and going, tell me the story behind this. And he, you know, that was him with his little uh, hippie jacket standing next to his conservative dad. 
Um, so that was a, one of the thrills of my lifetime. Um, I was privileged to be in the uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Davis over there when um, this group did a, a remarkable thing that we couldn't do in 1977 when we tried to save the May 4th site, and that was have the site that you're going to tour declared a national historic landmark. We were told they had to be 50 years old, and I don't get it because I think they declared Graceland a national historic landmark before Elvis would have even been 50, but go figure. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Davis, for that uh, incredible feat. <laughs> but this woman I really want to credit with um, in 2018, when I heard she was speaking at Chautauqua, I had no idea what we would find there when I went with Tom Grace and John Cleary, another wounded student, to hear her talk. It was the first time I saw a university, and I'll probably tear up, first time I saw a university president doing what we've done for 49 years, like being up there with the placards of our college friends, being up there talking about how important this is, being up there promising that this should never happen again on a college campus, owning it, apologizing for it. I was numb. I could not believe what I was hearing. This is Dr. Davis and I um, at the Board of Trustees meeting when uh, I delivered a message on behalf of the uh, wounded students and their families. Uh, thanking the Board of Trustees who voted unanimously to take ownership of May 4th, to take ownership of the commemoration, to take ownership of the education of which you are a part today, um, and to uh, teach the right lessons and to serve as what Dr. Car uh, Dr. Warren uh, said so eloquently, to serve as the wounded healer. I had an opportunity to thank the Board of Trustees and to publicly apologize to them that I interrupted their meeting out in Canton, Ohio in 1977 when we found after they moved so that we, they, our protests wouldn't interrupt their meeting, we found out where they were in Canton and interrupted it. Anyway, so I did have an opportunity to, to, to thank the Board of Trustees but also apologize to them for my past behavior, being the wounded healer myself. Um, I have to thank Tom Grace for the role that he played not just last night as a continuing educator on May 4th, but also for this wonderful book um, that he has produced to put it, to, to create the, the history that we need that is so um, not just forgotten, but also misrepresented in uh, history books, particularly Ohio history books. Uh, my son's included in eighth grade that had a picture of the National Guard shooting us, uh, and it said in the caption, uh, during the Vietnam War, some um, students protested across the country. Here at Kent State, the protests got out of hand, where students threw rocks at the National Guard. The National Guard, fearing for their lives, um, opened fire, killing four and wounding nine. I was not successful in getting that book out of the curriculum at Aurora Schools, but I certainly pulled my uh, son from that class. Um, these are the crazies today. Um, and I'm still hanging around with crazy people. This is me at the Women's March with two of our youngest protesters there, Girls Rule, and was happy to meet my daughter who's in New York at the Women's March. Um, and was, this is me just two weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, at uh, the White House protesting what's going on in the detention camps. And basically my uh, Facebook page is no longer happy news about what's going on, um, but really uh, what's going on in the world uh, rather than my life. And um, today, I actually have a day job. I am the chief communications officer for the Cleveland Public School District. My first teaching job was in Cleveland in 1977, uh, where I taught at Louise Munoz Marin School when it was actually called Lincoln Junior High School at the time. And that was the year that Cleveland schools ran out of money. And so I ended up going to the suburbs to teach where I could actually pay my rent. Uh, but always looked at Cleveland urban education and said to my colleagues, that's where the important work is. That's where we should be. And it was my journalism training here at Kent State and then eventually my PhD studies in K-12 administration that made me want to continue to tell the stories of what happens in education. And so that took me to um, Cleveland where they had their own school shooting in uh, the year before I went there. And the communications officer that I 
ended up replacing uh, left because they just weren't prepared for it. And I thought I would segue to this just because I want you to understand that a big part of the 50 years of healing is really understanding that whether you are shot on a high school campus or on a college campus or on the streets of America, you will never forget, and you want to know that people will never forget. We have the same indelible scars. We have the same horrible memories. We deal with the same trauma. And I never really quite understood my anger. I always gave the most angry speeches. Tom will tell you that. When Dean Kaler was always trying to find forgiveness in his heart, I would always say, Dean, how could you do that? I was just so angry for so long, but I didn't really understand it till I was on this side, on the side where President White was, where Dr. Cartwright was, Lester Lefton, Bev Warren. There are deadly shootings in schools today. And I thought, I can't talk to you about Kent say 50 years ago without talking to you about my experience at Parkland this, you know, this last year in 2018. Because it was there at Parkland that I saw the challenge is still among us. People still are not paying attention to the violence that happens here. I was a Sputnik kid because we were under our desk fearing Russia. Not fearing what can happen within our own nation when we are killing each other. At Success Tech High School, it was just one of our kids who went through on a normal day, opened fire on two kids, two teachers, and then killed himself. Today in your schools, they're talking about Alice, you know, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, evacuate, which didn't work, in, work at Columbine because the shooter actually knew where they would be locking down and went right there and shot the kids right under the desks, which is why we now say run, hide, fight, because you, as you saw the pictures in the hallway at Success Tech in Cleveland, the first instinct is to run. Just run. Get out. Okay? And then hide if you can't. And then fight if that's not it. I had the privilege of being at Broward, and, um, and I think for me that was the most healing thing because I saw at Broward what didn't happen here. And I forgive my university for not knowing how much pain we were in, how much we needed them not to send tuition refunds to the families of the four dead students in their names, by the way, but to reach out to us. I happened to be in the new president's office, and he showed me a folder full of letters that came to uh, their office, the Kent State University president's office in 1970, with people criticizing our professors for making it easy on us when we were finishing our courses through the mail. I, I, I was at Parkland and I reflected on what, how pain, how much in pain that educational community was in. And I watched how they held each other, how they talked it through, how they healed together with the help of their educational institution. The night, be and, and the night before um, I left, I asked Tracy Clark, who was my counterpart there in the public information office, I said, show me your, your text messages. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I want to see exactly what was happening at the moment of the shooting. And she showed me this picture. And they were talking about um, the parent link, which is what they were using to, to uh, communicate to people that their superintendent was giving away a free car to the teacher of the year. And then it said, incident command being turned back to principal, police and fire scaling down, because there were firecrackers or something shot off at another school, and they um, were moving on to something else. And then it was shooting at MSC, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Huh? I heard code red because of firecrackers. Too soon to know the truth. Responders en route. Shooting at MSC? What? Report of shooting, unknown. It's just confusion. Hopefully bad information will report more. En route. Four shots so far, rescuing now. Shooter may be on campus. That's the, that's the Broward County, um, the OSPA team is at Park Trails now. 
That's the sheriff's office. Eight shot, eight or more down. Suspect may be in custody. Possible explosive device concerns, because that's what was happening at the other school. Maybe one teacher down. Twelve may be down. I'm at staging area with the Broward County Sheriff's Office, still clearing buildings toward Pine Island. Still clearing students out, suspecting custody. Public information officer should work with the Sheriff's Office public information officer. Estimate of 10 to 20 down. This one you can't see. Someone has to tell me where parents can meet students. Instantly it was news and we all who are in education said there but by the grace of God. And the media starts reporting it even before we as public information officers can tell what's really going on and can tell families where to go. As we know, and one thing that, that helps me a lot, because I meet with our safety team, which you should know with your safety team, what is the plan? This is the superintendent telling people where they can reunite. But this looked like us 50 years ago, doing it on our own. This was us. People in the Broward County Sheriff's Office, a lot of them were fired because they didn't go in. I have a great deal of comfort in Cleveland because I meet with our safety team all the time and your people should be doing that too, to not only know where families should go within the first five minutes so they're not all converging on the scene of the, of the school, which, is, which made the first responders have to park four blocks away. But they waited outside. But this was the most remarkable thing, to see these young kids who just like us had just come out of such a traumatic experience, getting so much help, but also turning their fear, their anger, their pain into purpose. Therapy dogs, this broke my heart, to see the role that it played in helping that community to heal. Imagine bringing the kids back in just to find their book bags where they dropped them. This helped them to heal too, turning their anger into activism at the state legislature, fighting for all of us for gun control, for America to realize we have got to stop killing each other. 43,000 Americans were killed in the Korean War. 58,000 in Vietnam, 116,000 killed in World War I, 405,000 killed in World War II. Pat. 624,000 killed in the Civil War. America needs to understand when we are on the verge of another civil war. If there's something you can teach that's worth knowing, it is that. Whether you're a history teacher, whether you are a journalism teacher, an English teacher, a science teacher, teach about climate too. We have to stop killing each other and tolerating it when we do. That is worth knowing. I'll take your questions. You mentioned the healing process and you know showing when Kent, I, the word isn't embraced, I, I don't know what the right word is, um, but what was the time frame? I mean, when did Kent State take ownership of this and say this isn't something to be ashamed of or you know, when, when did that happen when you were talking about the timeline? N Ninety-nine.
Yeah, but it didn't come easy, and it really didn't take hold in earnest until, I mean, we marched on the president's office in, was it that, was it that year in the 25 that we marched on the office of the president to um, get the markers? It's funny, like Tom and I are going, what year? And when you meet with my brother, who is remarkable, and I already mentioned that to you, like he has all these facts and dates and times. He's like a walking library of May 4th. So he is such, you can ask him exactly the year and probably the time uh, that that happened. But you know, it didn't come easy because, I mean, even to get, even to get the ear of the president was difficult. That is not difficult anymore. Kent State University truly has embraced its history, truly understands that only by knowing and understanding it can you possibly actually move on from it, but also never make sure that it never happens again. And this is a very important part of the history, and I just so admire you for taking time to learn about it. What other questions? Who else has, there's one. I guess I just wanted to throw out maybe in defense of some of the past presidents, I felt like the governor was trying to close this university when I started in 79. Every time they did something, it was like, we're going to take money from you and give it to Akron U. And I felt those, yeah, they were probably maybe under a lot of pressure because <laughs> it seemed like the government well, there's no question that he was funding more money into Akron University in hopes of closing down Kent State. That's, there's more than one way to uh, d destroy a legacy. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could um, elaborate more on the 25 indicted, what they were, what the indictments were. I, I assume that yours was with the rock throwing, assumed rock throwing, but was all, were all 25 students indicted on throwing items or were there other things involved? There were various charges, and they stemmed starting on Friday night through Monday. I, I might have been the only woman indicted for Monday, May 4th, but there was some indicted connection with the ROTC fire, some in connection with um, actions on Friday or Sunday. Um, and the main thing is they, they were, um, they succeeded in doing one thing by indicting us. Uh, we had a gag order put on us so we couldn't talk about it. So the myths that the National Guard were um, perpetrating stood. And then we always um, look to the trials as our opportunity to get the truth out. And then uh, a couple days into the trial, our, our wonderful attorney, David Scribner, from the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, when they dropped all of our indictments, everybody was jumping up and celebrating. And I just saw him pacing in the back of the room looking so troubled. And I went back to him and asked him why he was so upset and I realized that he knew what we would soon know that we had lost our chance to publicly tell people what happened on May 4th and have the guardsmen actually talk about it too. Other questions? No more questions? Yeah. Have any of the guardsmen, to the best of your knowledge, had any like PTSD or have you heard any individual reports? I know you're not getting group reports, but I'm, I have to think that some of the guardsmen that were there on the hill have had a lot to live with. Well, my brother is one of the people that most often says they suffered too um, and has been um, in touch over the years with a couple of people, and I will yield to him that question that he can talk with you about actual conversations that he has had, not just where I showed you the picture of him with Colonel Fassinger, but also with different guardsmen that we have reached out to over the years. Um, it is obvious that this is something that's difficult for them too, but I hope it'll be like the Civil War when at their 50th anniversary, survivors of the two came together in the blue and the gray and actually embraced each other and said, we have something to learn from this. And we we should never have been fighting. And I, I still hold out hope that they will, but that, that's a question I'll yield to my brother Alan about names and the extent to which they have shared on a personal level um, their own, um, the way that they've grappled with that. Another question? Yes. I'm not sure there's an answer to this, but like, you know, is what do we know about like you know why you know why the shootings happen? <laughs> you know, like was there an order or that that kind of thing? Do we know, or what extent do we know about it? Well, actually, um, my 
can get this up. I don't know if this is still working. I have a picture in here further into this with my brother with the Struby tape. Um, Alan actually has done a lot of research for his book and while he was at, the, at Yale doing some research there, uh, actually got a digital copy of the Struby tape, which was a cassette tape uh, in a player sitting on a windowsill at Johnson Hall. And it was the first evidence uncovered, uh, and Alan held a press conference showing that there seems to be an order to fire where they say right here, set point fire. And that uh, we tried to have investigated at the federal level and failed, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not gonna continue to try to show that somebody ordered uh, the shooting. And um, if we can't prove it with uh, that digital evidence, we have to hope that some guardsmen will admit it. Being given from the federal level, <laughs> or could a state have just done it? Well, that's a technical question that we, you know, the, the people are dying as we as we know. But I have to believe that the kind of rhetoric that we're hearing today is exactly and directly connected to the mindset of people who just looked at us as targets. I mean, imagine, because people would go, these guards were so young. Not necessarily. I don't care how young you are. I don't care if you're 18, and some of them are in their 40s. It doesn't matter who, whoever you are, however old you are. When you look through the scope of a rifle and you see 18, 19-year-old college kids running in the opposite direction, what makes you not only shoot but continue to shoot for 13 seconds? Keep shooting. What makes you do that? What makes you keep shooting? There has to be some kind of fear, some kind of anger that makes you want to make that kind of statement. We are searching for that. Yeah, and I have to hold accountable Richard Nixon and his divisive rhetoric, his hateful rhetoric, Agnew, Reagan, Rhodes, so similar to what we're hearing today in an attempt to pit American against American in what could be eventually another civil war. If we just disagree with each other so much, we go back out and fight. And that's why what I do a lot with student activists today is just warn them about doing what we had that had the, the greatest potential on Monday, to amass ourselves in numbers. I say to students today, just imagine if students on college campuses using social media said, we're not going to classes until you make college education affordable. We're not going to classes, or we're gonna vote as a block for the candidate that forgives us our student loan debt so that we have a hope of a future. Like, what if they just did what we did, and it's peaceful, it's not the actions we took on Friday night or the militant actions on Saturday or Sunday, the peaceful sit-in. It is connecting with students across this country in a common voice and getting out to vote. We didn't have the right to vote, they do. If there's one thing you can do at your, in your schools is talk to them about their civic duty. We as teachers have a social responsibility to remind them how precious and how fragile democracy is. We have a chance to have them use their voice, learn to use their voice in peaceful ways. And that's why it's so wonderful that we have united with the university in making sure that Kent State models for other college campuses, including high school campuses, what it means to have debate and disagree with each other and not hurt each other over it. And that's what Todd, uh, the new university president, Todd Diakon, is committed to, to carrying on what um, I think Dr. Beverly Warren started so beautifully at Chautauqua, to be not just a wounded healer helping us after 50 years to cope with the trauma that we experienced here, but to teach others, including high school uh, teachers that are gonna deal with similar trauma um, in some places, but also know that how we can just teach people how to engage in civil discourse, and to do so not just uh, in a civil way, but also with one that has impact and actually changes things in ways that help people. Any other questions? Yeah. You said that criminal charges were dropped. Were there any civil lawsuits related to the shootings? 
we'll talk about that too. Um, Alan and Tom were part of that civil uh, lawsuit uh, that resulted in monetary damages, uh, meager. I, I was one of the few that really disagreed with it, but I understand why they felt it was important to at least get an admission of, of guilt and responsibility from the guardsmen. Um, people felt impatient to get money for Dean Kaler, who was struggling um, in a wheelchair. Um, and I think, wh what was it, the, the parents of the dead students, did they get $20,000? $15,000. So it was meager, um, but it was the only uh, public statement that we had of uh, wrongdoing uh, and ownership on the part of the National Guard. Who, by the Ohio Grand Jury, who indicted us in 1970, hailed them for bravery. And, and criticized us for using four-letter words in our anti-war chants. No more questions? I didn't know if, if uh, Lori wanted to play that Danny Miller clip or not. Where is she? Mindy? Okay. I think we're going to proceed with the tour. Do you want to? Please help me uh, thank Dr. Roseanne Chick-Tampora.